Today, we're going to talk about one of my top three articles that I've written in the past, and that is on the subject of the art of being discreet. This is based on my own observations and also um, on a book that I'll tell you about a little bit later. If you think about the condition of, I don't want to get too deep, but the condition of humanity, you think about the rich and the famous who are in rehab, um, some who are ending their lives and doing the same things all the other classes are doing, even though they have all the material possessions someone could want. You think about the working class who are fighting to hold jobs that really they hate. And you think about queer style fits in, that's our subject. When you think about these profound things that are going around us, and you may ask yourself, where does style fit in? And I can tell you so many people um, in a certain group have written and said, what are you doing? It's just about clothes. And uh, Hugo and I have always said, it's really not about clothes, what we're doing. It's more about emotion. And I think that'll become evident as you watch more of these talks and then you will draw your own conclusion as to where style fits in in your life. We can say with pretty much confidence after 10 years of being in this business that when you work on feeling like you have developed your style and owning your own style, it translates into a better emotional place in your life. Um, if you also think about um, style as a sort of power that you can play with in either direction, it's very interesting because no matter if you have a lot of money and you need for nothing, you can neglect your style and actually fall down in the eyes of others in position. But if you are of humble means, and you have very little in life, you can use style to elevate yourself in the presence of others. And that's really interesting when you think about the power style has to move you in either direction. If that's something that you want to embrace, then why not? You know, it's uh, some people like cars, some people like watches, some people like antiques. Nothing wrong with liking style, and I think that um, everyone should at least try to own their own style. Some people think to be uh, in that element of style, you have to be a natural born beauty. This is a huge myth. If you think about Oscar Wilde and you think about Winston Churchill, these are not natural born beauties, although still today they're thought of as the epitome of style. You think about today in fashion with women. Um, the thing is to get the girl who is more homely looking, maybe the girl who wasn't so popular in high school, hone in on her more odd and interesting qualities and bring her into this style arena. And usually that's much more interesting than the natural born beauty who is suddenly stylish. So never think that you have to be a natural born beauty to own your style. But one thing that I think you have to ask yourself is what you are aspiring to reach. And this is where I wanna move into this book that has always fascinated me since I first uh, saw this book on the horizon. And that is Paul Fussell's, and I hope I'm pronouncing his name right. It might be Paul Fussell. He wrote the book in 1983 and it's entitled Top Class, A Guide Through the American Status System. And in this book, he talked about the upper class, which we all see every time we go to any big city throughout the world. But he said that he wanted to contrast the upper class with a more discreet class that you may or may not know about. He called it the top class. He proceeded to describe the upper class, which may be very familiar to you. He said the upper class were mainly, for the most part, attention seekers. They went for the nice cars, the beautiful large houses, the jewelry, uh, the timepieces, um, the best of the best clothes, and the most prestigious events. But then when he spoke about the top class, which was much higher in terms of financial earnings than the upper class, he described these people as striving to be anonymous. They valued anonymity. They looked for 
freedom to move about outside the chains of wealth. They wanted to be seen for who they were and who they are instead of what they have. They also valued blending in the crowd instead of being set apart from the crowd. Instead of these houses and cars and jewelry, what they sought in terms of material possessions were heirlooms and rare items that most people wouldn't have the, the pleasure to own. So this was very uh, startling to see the contrast between the upper class and the, and the top class. You couldn't really be much different. And I had the honor to, or just the privilege to witness uh, a person who was in the top class. Uh, she uh, was, had generational wealth. I think uh, at one point her family had the Harlan Check Company and before that another company. So I observed her. She had a modest home. Um, she would, did have a modest home in a very nice area, I admit. Um, she had a forgettable car because honestly I cannot remember what kind of car she had. The interesting thing about her watch was it was Cartier, which was, uh, you know, timeless. You know, it is a pun, but it's a timeless watch. But what she would wear during the weekdays is a Timex watch. So it was just a Timex watch with a black band, and it was almost like her little banter, you know, with the wealthy set that she did. And I, from what I've heard, some other people do that in, in this set of, of people. She did have the pearls, the big cliche, the grandmother's pearls. She did have that. Um, the clothes she wore were Land's End. I don't know if you remember this brand, and um, Ralph Lauren, but she was careful not to show labels unless, you know, it was not something, unless it was something she couldn't avoid. Um, on a personal level, she went through a horrific divorce and I watched her go through this. And the way she behaved was she was, had this a gift to acknowledge her pain and just be okay with her pain for a while, but then she just let everything go to her past and move forward um, in a very determined way. So I, I really felt like I was privileged just to witness this different set of people and learn what I could from her. And one thing she said before I move on is she said, whenever we would be in a group and we would judge someone, she said, be careful because everybody has a family story. And they had the superstition in their family that if they spoke or judged other people that their family story would become worse. So it was nice to, to witness this way of life and learn what I could from it. Now let's move into something more fun. What are some signals of, say, a top class person? So I'm just gonna jump into some things that you might notice. One thing is they tend to wear shirts with frayed edges on the collar. So these are little coats. So if you see someone wearing a shirt and there's obvious frayed edges around the collar of their shirt, it's a little code that they use. That, as a matter of fact, back in the day when this, this group of people had drivers, they would take their shirts and give them to their driver so their driver could move around with it and actually make it look a little bit worn because they didn't want the sparkling new shirt. So that was kind of a funny observation. The other thing is that this group um, admires old things more than new things. They'd rather receive a bag of clothes from their uncle or their or a grandfather or a grandmother instead of going out to buy new clothes. Um, there are also uh, little codes, for example, a person in the top class would never have a collar gap. In fact, you might see them pulling their jacket down a lot because in the old days of early tailoring, it was a signal that if you had this gap in back like this, that you didn't really understand tailoring and it was an automatic acknowledgement of uh, maybe your, your place in life. I don't really like this thought of the place in life. And I think that the top class really didn't look down on people um, in terms of their place in life. In fact, they did the opposite. The top class is known to know the names of almost everyone that worked in the home. They knew the names of the husband or wife, the names of the children, and would ask about 
the well-being of the people that worked for them. So they actually elevated people who weren't in their class, probably because of a disgust of seeing people um, and new money who treated others poorly. This is my guess. Um, so I, I think that is one thing that we can learn when you see someone who's treating a waiter poorly or is looking down on a housekeeper or something like that. That's just a really anathema to someone who would be in the top class. Another thing that's just um, funny to watch is that they like to hide their labels. They just mortified to show labels and it's more of a discreet way of living not to display labels. There's other small codes like um, when you're going to a formal event, they know that the red carnation on the lapel means that your, your mother is alive and the white carnation means that your mother is passed on. So there's little codes like that. Codes like there's a handkerchief in the pocket, usually of either a man or in the purse of, of a woman. There's always that handkerchief nearby. Um, other things, of uh, jewelry and accessories are kept to a minimum. For example, I intentionally wore too many accessories to show you. I'm wearing a scarf and I also have braces on. So a top class person would normally look at themselves before they leave and remove an accessory. And I think Coco Chanel maybe said that as well. So this is a, a fun thing too to try from time to time just to see how that changes your look. To wrap it up, a few more fun things to, to know. Um, in the top class, this is filtered down across the board, especially in Europe. When you raise your glass for a toast and you toast someone, it's also a code to always make eye contact with the person that you're toasting. So that's another thing that you can look for as a code. And finally, I'll wrap up with something very important, and that is a behavioral um, code among the top class. The two things that they take care to do is listen very well. They don't like compliments that much. If you compliment, do it very lightly because that's considered a form of flattery. So they're very good listeners. They'll often repeat back what you said to them. And the last thing is gossip is absolutely forbidden unless it's maybe with your sisters or your family or your very best friend. That's a total sign of not being discreet. And this is my take based upon the writings of uh, Mr. Fussell and my observations. And I hope that you found it interesting. I would love for you to leave comments and tell me your take on the subject because I'm sure I could learn something as well. So until next time, cheers.